Sri Lanka lies in a prime location to take advantage of China's Belt and Road Initiative. How did the Belt and Road Summit lay the groundwork for new achievements between the two countries? What is Sri Lanka's attitude toward Chinese companies working in its territory? Sri Lanka is considering a special zone in Hamban Tota for Chinese investors. What are the latest developments in the special zone? Compared to Colombo Port City, what's the special significance of Hamban Tota? Like China, Sri Lanka has a rich Buddhist heritage. Famous Buddhist spots such as Sri Dalada Maligawa and the Dambula Cave Temple are world-renowned, like the Shaolin Temple of China. What are the opportunities for the two countries seeking cooperation in Buddhism or other cultural areas? Sri Lanka has moved closer to China in recent years. Will it become a proxy battlefield for India and China as some in the West predict? How should Sri Lanka develop its ties with China while maintaining its relationship with India? This year marks the 60th anniversary of the diplomacy between China and Sri Lanka, which lies in the prime location to take advantage of China's Belt and Road Initiative. In practice, how will the Belt and Road Summit lay the groundwork for new achievements between the two countries? What is Sri Lanka's attitude towards the Chinese companies working in its territory? And how should Sri Lanka balance its relationship with China while maintaining the traditional friendship with India? To discuss these issues and more, today I'm very honored to be joined by Sarah Amnugama, Special Assignment Minister of Sri Lanka. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Yang Ray. Welcome to Dialogue, sir. Thank you. What do you think of uh, the opening speech by President Xi Jinping? And what are the points that have impressed you most? It was a very impressive speech and a very comprehensive speech. What struck me was the emphasis on connectivity. When we talk of the road and we talk of the belt, it is essentially a historic connectivity, different parts all the way from the west to China and beyond, some overland, some by sea, and all really connecting people with different cultures, different economies, different religions. Do you think this is a, a deliberate attempt to rebuild the world economic order? And do you think this smacks of a geo-economic uh, reverie against other major economies such as uh, the United States and Japan? Uh, no, I don't think it, it's like an open uh, economic challenge. But this was an opening that was there, inherent, which I think uh, President Xi has uh, seized on that opportunity because there are historic links among the all the countries that were represented here on this on the road and the belt and particularly when the European Union is in trouble and when President Trump withdraws American presence from some of the areas such as uh, Southeast Asia and North America free trade zone not NAFTA and therefore China seized the opportunity is that your point uh, no I would say that uh, well, in the, in the world, uh, there are opportunities. And uh, doing your own thing, your own imaginative approach, does not necessarily mean that you're in conflict with uh, any other approach or that you're denigrating that approach. Poor countries need all the assistance it can get. So while all those things there, for example, uh, you have the multilateral agencies. They were represented at this meeting. I saw the Secretary General of the United Nations, there was the chair president of the World Bank, there was also uh, Christian Lagarde, Lagarde of the IMF. of IMF, so the multilateral, the major multilateral agencies were also represented. So there are many initiatives uh, at various levels, but this I think is a very serious and a very uh, constructive approach to some of the problems that particularly the poorer countries face. And one thing President Xi mentioned was that we had to think of the people of those countries. I mean, there may be leaders, there may be political parties, there may, but finally we have to try and uh, uplift the, 
uh, standards of people and he emphasized leave no one behind. That is the concept that uh, once you think of sustainable development, it is not only to enough to get all those nice GDP figures, per capita figures, but ensure that, uh, as, as he mentioned, and as the literature now refers to, don't leave anybody behind. No. They also have to be uh, given a hand to improve their lives. There's no question about the global impact of the Belt and Road Initiative by President Xi Jinping, and the initiative was first put forward four years ago. He reviewed uh, achievements over the past four years since uh, the option was put on the table in Kazakhstan by President Xi Jinping. Now, what do you think of uh, uh, legal and environmental risks for the Chinese uh, enterprises? Uh, for example, <coughs> Sri Lanka is a democracy. And when Rajapaksa, the former minister, uh, former prime minister, was in power, we invested in Hamatota. But when the opposition took the office, they suspended the project uh, and uh, spent some time reviewing the whole thing. And that means a lot of uh, costs for the Chinese investors. So uh, many skeptical voices in China say, wait a minute, perhaps it's time to assess the risks. Well, Sri Lanka is a democratic country. We have regular elections. Governments come and governments go. And uh, the main thing to emphasize is really the continuity. Mm -hmm. Though there have been reviews, uh, for example, the Kalambu Port City project, which is the sort of symbolic uh, mega project where we are uh, creating a new uh, extension, a uh, yeah, new extension of the city of Kalambo. Uh, of course, there was a review for about a year uh, because earlier there were some criticisms that environmental factors were not taken into consideration and so on. Was it just a political excuse? No, I don't think it was a political excuse. This so do you think this is a family uh, corruption scandal? <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't put it like that. Because whatever the government may be, this is a good venture for Sri Lanka. Not many countries can afford the, the, have been afforded the opportunity to have such a large extent of land annexed to its own uh, physical boundaries because usually uh, island states like Sri Lanka we we lose some land every year due to erosion sea erosion and things like that uh, but in fact here we are gaining uh, more land and that will be developed as a financial center so I think that's a uh, it's something that is very good and important for Sri Lanka so though there were during this transition period a re-evaluation, uh, the fact of the matter is that there is continuity now. When, if you go to Colombo now, I think uh, work is going on even at a faster pace. Few in China would uh, underestimate the huge influence of your neighboring country, India, given the alleged Po theory along the Indian coast, um, the coastline of the Indian Ocean, and therefore some uh, political forces in your country may have been supported by New Delhi in, you know, giving China a hard time. Now, this is also part of the conspiracy theory. Yeah. I don't quite believe this, but I'd like to have your thoughts. Yeah. I don't believe in it at all. Sri, Sri Lanka and India have been friends for, from time immemorial. As they say, both history and geography demands that we be close to India. So that we have had so many cultural, economic, uh, all sorts of uh, social relationships. But that does not mean that uh, we uh, don't follow an independent uh, uh, policy when it comes to our own economic development. We are, we are not, uh, if I may say so, we believe that economic development and good relations with one country need not necessarily mean that we are jeopardizing or downgrading relations with another country. In the modern world, we have to have a, a sophisticated uh, approach so that we can be friends with uh, many countries. However, here is a piece of evidence uh, which may support our concerns. Yeah. Chinese nuclear submarines have made several friendly visits to Sri Lanka in recent years. However, on May the 
11th, the government in Sri Lanka refused Chinese request for a submarine's docking at Colombo port uh, the week next. So what's the concern of Sri Lanka? Is it related to displeasure from India? No, not at all. You see, any military uh, support, maybe docking, uh, maybe exercise, whatever, has to have the active concurrence of the host country. That is a sovereign right of Sri Lanka. It may be China, it may be India, it may be United States, it may be Japan. That has to be done only with the sovereign concurrence of Sri Lanka. At, at any uh, contentious time, critical time, it is not confined to any particular country or any particular type of weaponry. The country has a right to say, look, we don't think it's opportune at this time. So really one should not look on it as any type of uh, anger at a country or attempt to uh, downgrade a country. No. It's very important, it's, as you know, in this world where there are so many military conflicts, uh, so many uh, military matters in contention, the so sovereign state must take a very responsible decision to allow or not to allow. It does not mean that our relations with that country uh, is suffering in any way. We have very good relations, but that does not mean that uh, more uh, material or any uh, vehicles of war or something like that uh, can freely come in. No, that there we have to establish our authority. It would be a stupid mistake if China has ignored the huge influence of India geopolitically, particularly when you go back to examine what happened in the year 2006 when Tamil Tiger was about to be eliminated. Indians, first of all, give you some helicopters, uh, but you requested to have more, but the, the, your humble request was brutally turned down because of Indian concern on the influence of their Tamil minority in their parliament. Therefore, China filled in the vacuum. And when you look at the military parade, the current military hardware that the Sri Lankan forces use, most of them were made in China. Again, this may have fueled speculation that Chinese uh, military presence uh, has been increased in the uh, subcontinent of South Asia. That may have uh, uh, triggered more concerns uh, for the nationalist newspaper in India has the media fanfare about, well, the Po theory again. No, I don't think that's, you a, don't think so. that's a accurate narration of the situation. Because in the last part of the war, India made a very positive contribution to the Sri Lankan side to end the war. As you know, the Indian uh, Prime Minister, Mr. Rajiv Gandhi, was assassinated by the LTT. LTT interfered in the politics and social life of South India. It became a big problem for India, while of course there is a large population, Tamil population, on both sides of the Pork Strait. The fact of the matter is that India supported us very much during the last days of the war. At the same time, we also uh, got assistance from China. Of course, we bought a lot of uh, weaponry from China. Uh, but I don't see any contradiction at all. Small country like Sri Lanka, we must have friends on every side. Any friendship with India does not in any way entail hostility to China. Or any friendship with China does not in any way Entail hostility. We understand to India. your efforts to maintain a balance between yes. these two uh, economic giants, uh, but the Sri Lankan government came under fire from the Western media for the alleged violation of human rights in uh, cracking down on the Tamil Tiger rebe rebellion uh, in those days. Uh, how did you respond to their yeah, criticism? Very, very clearly, you know, Western agencies, uh, sometimes non governmental organizations have made various allegations. But the fact of the matter is that this, uh, in the end of the war, it was almost a surgical uh, operation, almost a humanitarian operation. Were you suggesting that uh, the Tamil guerrilla soldiers may have used a human shield to yes, protect they have, themselves? Yes, they have used a human shield also. But more than that, this matter was raised by the Human Rights uh, Council in Geneva. But uh, consecutively,
the international community has not gone along with all these charges. It is true that the Human Rights Council have said that this needs to be investigated. There were debates whether foreign investigators could come or whether the domestic mechanism would suffice. There was there. But the latest decision is that the international community has given Sri Lanka another two years during which it can uh, enter into the reconciliation process. And as you can see, we are getting further and further away from the actual uh, war situation to a reconciliation situation. So uh, I think the whole world uh, recognizes and wants to give time to Sri Lanka to heal those wounds of the war. And the longer we get away from the actual fighting, people are not interested in, uh, you know, finger pointing. There are, if there have been human rights violations, certainly they have to be investigated. That has nothing to do with the whole army or the whole government or a whole community. There may be some people who have violated laws. That can happen anywhere. But Sri Lankan government as an entity has always taken up the position that the vast majority of our uh, civilian population, of our military population, have acted in a humanitarian way. If there are people who have broken international laws, then they will be dealt with. We understand the official line of the Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka government. Now, China has also faced the issue of a terrorism and extremism in areas such as the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region and some parts of uh, Tibet. Currently, uh, the ruling party in Taiwan, the Democratic Progressive Party, stand for the eventual secession and independence of the renegade province, Taiwan. So maintaining stability uh, is something the Chinese government holds so dear. Over the past nine years, I believe, uh, your government has projected a lot into the process of uh, national reconciliation and the post-war rebuilding. What can we learn from the Sri, Lan the Sri Lanka government in uh, enhancing solidarity and in building consensus between uh, different ethnic groups? Well, I think both China and Sri Lanka, in fact, no country really thinks that violence is the answer to problems, ethnic problems. It is only a matter of the last resort. Uh, every country tries as much as possible, especially in the modern world, when there are uh, concepts of human rights, uh, of democratic uh, organizations and so on, you try as much as possible to reconcile, to look at these problems and see whether there are genuine grievances. China has done that, Sri Lanka has done that, but in the global community today, terrorism is a fact of life. We have to see, we are small groups due to communication, uh, you know, the ease of communication, due to the ease of obtaining weaponry, the international global ideas of terrorism, the techniques of terrorism, all that is spreading in the country. But I don't think any country, uh, certainly not China and Sri Lanka, believes that violence is the answer. But it has to safeguard its people. It has to safeguard its laws. So let, we, let we have to see that th th we have get a balance in that. Sure. It's always a, a matter of how to craft a balance diplomatically or in terms of domestic politics. Unlike a big country like China, religion may have played a big role, broadly speaking, in cementing uh, domestic consensus. Now, China doesn't have a state religion. Thailand is known for being a country of smile because of the uh, pervasive presence of Buddhism. Now, your country is also known for having the Buddhist uh, tourist attractions. There are he heavy religious elements uh, in building the soft power of Sri Lanka. My question is, to what degree do you think a faith and religion can help uh, build the consensus and putting people of different backgrounds together so that they can have their Sri Lanka dream, and in our case, we have the China dream. Well, as you mentioned, Thailand and Sri Lanka, both predominantly Buddhist countries. And one of the basic teachers, teachings of the Buddha is Ahimsa. Ahimsa means non-violence. That the, one of the basic tenets of Buddhism is 
non-violence. Of course, while we have that cultural uh, requirement of non-violence, there is also state power. You know, the, on one side, you have uh, the cultural and religious values of the country. On the other hand, you have the obligations of the state, because in order to promote the rights of one citizen, you cannot negate the rights of another citizen. So, all modern countries like Sri Lanka, China, we have our own constitutional positions and the constitution guarantees certain inherent rights of all its citizens. So, in Sri Lanka, we have a great opportunity. Will religions uh, unite as well as divide? I mean, if you have people of different ethnicities, different religions, sometimes when you highlight that, we must not allow it to prejudice the rights of other religions and other ethnicities. So, one of the problems, particularly of Thailand and Sri Lanka, is that in this highly uh, tolerant type of culture and society, how does the state function? The state has to perform certain functions like uh, equality of all its citizens, guarantee security and safety, things like that. So, it may be when it comes to religion, you have widespread ethical beliefs. Do you have a very powerful and active non-governmental organizations? Yes, we have, we have many non-governmental organizations. And what do you think of the role of the media? Well, Sri Lanka has a very good record when it comes to free media. Mm -hmm. Because we share actually the British tradition of newspapers, our early newspaper people, our early radio, television people, were all, um, if I may put it very broadly, Thank you so much. You are watching Dialogue with Mr. Sarah Amnugama, the Special Assignment Minister of Sri Lanka. We are honored to interview him during his current stay in Beijing to attend the Oval Summit. Stay with us, we'll be right back. <music> Welcome back, sir. Thank you. Your uh, ministerial job might be considered a troubleshooter. Uh, tell us briefly what do you do uh, to help your Prime Minister and perhaps your President in seeking solutions. Uh, time and again you use the word of uh, keeping balance. Now is that the most important political skill for living up to the expectation of your role? Well, Sri Lanka, just now we have a coalition government. Two parties which were uh, opposed to each other are now uh, working together on a common program. The president is from one party, the prime minister is from another. So as you know, this is a where coordination is extremely necessary. Uh, we cannot have a failure of communication. So you dine on the wine, you have dinners, you have uh, uh, whiskey, cigars, uh, you know, playing golf, uh, so that <laughs> you, you put, I uh, wish, put different people I together. I wish, but that is not so possible. <laughs> especially in a Buddhist country. But the fact of the matter is that when you work like that, there are so many immediate problems that come up. I represent the president very often because he has so many assignments, so many meetings. Then I, he says, well, okay, you go and represent me there. Or he is in several committees, things like that. So I have a background. I was a university teacher. Then I was a senior bureaucrat. And I worked for the United Nations. And you had a very strong media background. Yes. Uh, did that help? Very much. Very much so. Because if you are a media person, you always try to look at the other point of view. You know, media tends to be reviled by politicians because, uh, you know, journalists tend to be very critical. And uh, it means my job, for example, yes. is to grill people with tough questions. Yes. In that case, are you trusted by politicians? Well, we have to coexist. We don't have to love each other. But I think <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> you don't love each other, <laughs> but you have to respect each other. Yeah, we have to respect each other. Yeah. After all, one thing we must know about media is that they are doing a job. They are doing a job. They have their own deadlines. They have their own rules and regulations. They have their own hierarchy. So very often you find politicians don't understand that they are doing a job with their own internal rules and its own hierarchies and particularly its own deadlines. I mean, 
okay, a politician can uh, be a little dilatory, take time, he can say, okay, I'll, I'll attend to this matter or file tomorrow or the after, but you can't because you're on, you're, uh, on radio time or TV time or you have deadlines for your newspaper. Uh, during the economic transition and the transformation period for the society in China, for example, senior politicians are very demanding about the relationship between effectiveness, efficiency and justice. Justice is a luxury for the middle class because they are very uh, watchful and careful about rule of law. Therefore, for any politicians or strong men of an autocracy, they tend to get things done quickly overnight, regardless of uh, grievances and complaints of the middle class, who tend to go to court, to have endless of court hearings, and that means costs a lot of time, a lot of litigation. So we won't be able to have the state capitalism that is created and delivered the economic miracles in a country like China. So my puzzlement yeah. is, what has Sri Lanka government down. Yeah. No, that's the old theory that to get the trains to run on time, you know. But every country has a constitution. A constitution, and, of course. And it has its laws, which of course the courts uh, interpret. So that iron framework must remain because, okay, you have to get things done, you have to be efficient and so on, but that has to done, be done within the framework of the laws and constitution of that country. Otherwise there will be chaos. You know, the Hobbesian, what is called the Hobbesian state of nature, where life will be very short, where life will be awful. So this is a social contract. Social contract means that the laws of the land, the constitution of the land must prevail. In the long run, that is the only thing that gives the uh, confidence and the right, the safety of the individual. But all the time, the constitutional authorities have the right to amend the law, make laws, for example. I mean, there may be archaic laws, out-of-date laws, things don't answer the situation at that time, bureaucracies come in. But the way to deal with that problem is to use the constitutional process, to change the constitutional process so that you can make that. Now, for example, this example is the American Constitution, which is a written constitution. But from time to time, the Supreme Court or the other judicial authorities interpret it in terms of contemporary reality and contemporary needs. If you take the contrary argument that because these immediate needs are there, the trains must run on time, you must get these things done, we can ignore the constitution or we ignore the laws, then that will be a very bad thing. You know, uh, Mr. Minister, Ironically, some of the die-hard conservatives in my country would say, hey, look at this man, he must have been brainwashed in Western politics. Uh, you are hopelessly, uh, you know, the uh, hostage of Western culture, Western rule of law, and China wants to navigate its own course independently. Yeah. No, I don't agree to that, because these are universal laws, and Western or otherwise, the constitutional and other authorities have the right to change. I, I cannot say that governments can't change or governments can't bring new laws or try to enforce laws. That is their domain, that is right. But uh, after all, what you call a civilized country is a country of laws. So you have to have the primacy of the constitution and primacy of the law. I thank you so much for being with us and for the very nice and interesting points about the bilateral economic relations and particularly their domestic politics, which might be an important lesson for Chinese investors to learn as part of their homework. I thank you so much. Sir. Thank you very much. I enjoyed talking to you. Thank you. Thank you.